our study in things that we should give up. Now, we're in a season where we have encouraged folks to give some things up. It is a season we call Lent. It is a 40-day period from Ash Wednesday, excluding Sundays, to Easter Sunday morning. It is a spiritual preparation taken on by those who choose to do it of giving something up, whether it is something that you like, and uh, of course you could look at me and know that food would be one of the things that I like, uh, and I have altered some things in my food intake uh, during this season, and I'm giving those up, but I, I'm not doing that so that I can do what I obviously need to do, which is lose weight, uh, but so that I, when I don't eat what I want to eat, and I get that signal, I stop and say, God, what do you have for me today that would help me to better both live and walk in your perfect will? I hope that's what you're doing. That's what it's about. If you're giving up something sacrificially so others can have, or you're doing something special, for us, whatever your, your reason for that piece of, of this season, and you're giving it up, be sure that you always let it take you to the Lord and His perfect will for your life. Then it will accomplish what it's designed to do. You know, Jesus would often say, you know, uh, I don't need food like other people need food for the Father and His Word are my food. I hope you're staying plugged in. We're really enjoying reading Kathy and I through the Bible in this chronological uh, piece that we've put before you. And if you've got behind, just catch up or start where you left off and go back some other time. Don't let it frustrate you and overwhelm you. We need to be as God's people, people who know God's Word, people who desire to live God's Word, right? And one of the things, if we're going to both live His Word and know His Word, we need to pray His Word. And so I'm going to encourage you to pray. And I'm praying that God's going to provide for our church and its ministries. He's been doing that faithfully. We, we thought we were, I mean, we thought we had got one of those, uh, you know, one of those notices. You know, it's going to be tough this year. And I'm going to say it's been easy, but God's still blessed. We're still making the bills. We're still paying our people. And, uh, you know, there's some of you out there that are missing the blessing because you're not tithing. And maybe you're one of the people I'm praying about. I'm asking God to give us 15 tithers whether they come here as a member of the church or whether they're already here and they're not tithing because I believe God wants to do great things with this church and its ministry. And he can do that if we as his people are faithful and we trust him and then we trust him with what he's put in our hands. So with all of this, we come to the series, not just giving something up for a season, but we chose, that is, Rudy and I, as we prayed and we were looking for, as pastors, the spiritual direction of the church, uh, we, we chose things that we need to give up completely. You know, there are some things we need to give up. How many of you are still wrestling with your rock? <laughs> and somebody said, I wish you'd have never given me that rock. You know, giving up that control, giving up that sense, like we said last week, of superiority. You know, giving up that sense of expectation that always defeats us and frustrates us. And this morning we want to look up at one of the things that when we go to give it up, it is difficult. And depending on what that unique thing is in your life, that thing that's in my life, and that's giving up our enemies. Now, when I first read this, I thought, that's crazy. I mean, you want to, I mean, you mentioned it over there, Alex, a while ago. You know, we got some people doing some incredibly bad things. And we surely want to be those who keep them away from us and away from people that they're doing death and destruction to. I don't think that Jesus ever said that you were supposed to lose sight of who your enemies are. He just said you need to love them. And that's how you give them up. Go with me to the text that begins this section as we give up. And uh, I hope that you found your outline. And uh, I'm going to find mine and get it out so we can follow this. Uh, there are really three things that uh, will enable you to give up your enemies. One of them is to know them. 
One of them is to accept them. And I don't mean accept what they do. Listen to me. I don't mean accept what they do. I mean accept them for who and what they are. But there's something that is freeing in learning to accept them. And then in the end, love them. Love is choosing the highest good. And so if we know them and we accept them and we love them, I think we'll be on the course to doing what God wants us to do in this text today, which is giving up our enemies. Here in verse, verse 43 of Matthew 5 in this section called the Sermon on the Mount, this teaching section of Jesus where he has said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to do away with the Old Testament. He said, I came to bring it to its fullness. Now, now, folks, uh, I, I want to tell you one of the reasons that you and I need to do this and everything that's in this text that we're not reading we need to do is because Jesus wants for you. Eli, I didn't realize you were here. That's our college student over there. Man, we're glad you're here. I'm sorry, I just caught, caught you out of the corner of my... We wondered if you were home on break. He's doing such a good job. Uh, God's blessing with great intelligence and he's up there learning and he's going to be a great servant of the Lord as he goes out into the world. And, uh, you know, that has nothing to do with my sermon, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, but uh, I was talking... Oh, fulfillment. <laughs> uh, that's one of the things it is. As you look and you see the, the fruit of what happens in the body of Christ and, and you see that fruit being pruned and made ready to go out and serve. And so it's kind of like that kind of fulfillment. But fulfilled, I, I remember as a young boy, uh, I've always been curious, so I got a good name, George. Uh, you know, y'all know about Curious George, right? Uh, and, and so as a young boy, I really wanted to know how much water will a glass hold? And so I filled the glass up as far as I could fill it up. Because even though I want to know it, I've never been real patient. <laughs> so I hit the glass real quick. I didn't, as some of you who are more anal, you would have counted every drop. I filled the glass up and as far as I could, and then I adjusted the faucet to a drip where it's just dripping. And I, I learned some things, you know, concave, convex. Y'all remember studying that, you know? And this thing has kind of got that concave sense and gravity's reaching up there, pulling that water down in the center of the glass, and the drops are going in, the drops are going in. And then all of a sudden, what happens? The last drop it holds goes in, and then water begins to flow out. Much more than the last drop, right? That's what it means to be full filled. But if you don't tie that to the other text, which is that out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water or it will well up inside of you. It's talking about an unlimited resource. And folks, when we get to that place where God wants us to be, where we are full filled, it takes very little coming in to have a lot going out. And no matter how much you allow to go out, it never gets depleted in its resource because God wells up inside of us. And so Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to bring them to their fullness or their completeness. I want you to have this fulfilled life. And the way that you do that, folks, is by doing what God says. Now, you have got to. You will never survive unless you get to the place where you do it because you want to and not in the elementary sense where you have to. You have to come to that place where you realize that when I do this or I do that, that God has said it benefits me and it makes my life overflowing. And about the time you get in the middle of that, you get to this text. And notice what it says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor. Well, we don't have trouble loving people that love us. Well, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. But not, they're not as hard to love as people that don't love us. It says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. We like that part. 
In the Mishnah, they taught about how to live out the different rules and regulations, 613, 614 uh, do's and don'ts that uh, qualified how one should live, those ten principles we call the Ten Commandments. And, and so Jesus said, this isn't new to you. You've been hearing this. You've been practicing this. This is history for you. You've heard it said, love your neighbor. In fact, we know that. Jesus said that, right? There are two great commandments. Love God with all you are. Love what? Your neighbor as yourself. But he said, now I know you've heard all this, but I say unto you, now it's important that we know that Jesus is the one that's saying it, right? Because we know that God is speaking. And we know that when God speaks, it is one who has authority. In other words, he has to say so based on what you do and you don't do in accordance with what he said. But he speaks as one having authority. Never a man spake like this man. That's what they said. There's something unique and different. You sense the power of God. And, and I appreciate uh, a while ago the prayer about uh, the inspiration of the Spirit. Uh, I want to tell you, if, if this thing gets turned and, and plugged into your heart this morning, that isn't this preacher. It isn't my words. It's God taking his word and the word he's given me about that word and bringing it to life in you. That's why they went about preaching the Word. It didn't mean they just preached what was in the Bible. It means that when they took what God had said and they spoke it, God brought it to life and it changed the lives of people. So here is one who is speaking God's Word and it has come to life and he says, you've heard it say, Love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I say. Now, that, that's where we have to really get into the question, are we living, are we doing what God says? I tell you, love your enemies. What? Love those folks, Alex, that are doing those horrible things. Love the world that is twisted by ignorance and darkness of the prince and power of this age. Love the folks who are caught up in the greed of the flesh where they'll do whatever's necessary to take from you what they want. Love those folks. Love those folks who mistreat us. Love those folks who rob from us. Love those folks who take from... Yes, he said, love your enemies. Love your enemies. And pray. Oh, have you ever been asked to do that? That is hard. Here's a person who has robbed you, robbed the kingdom. Robbed, I, I mean, you just, I've been there. And the first thing that God asked me to do is pray for that person. And I said, I don't want to. <laughs> you know, God, you know what God said to me when I said that? No, he didn't say anything. He doesn't have to say it a second time. He's not like parents. We think, if, you know, we got to tell them five times. And kids get it, don't they? Go do such and such. Go to your room. Go to your room. I said go to your room. They, they know we don't mean it until we say it the last time. You know, they get it, you know. If we would learn to just say go to your room and then consequence would fall if they didn't, you know what? They get it. If we would just get it with God, God is only going to say it one time. And when he says it, he means it. And he doesn't change. And God said, love your enemies. Pray for them. Whether you want to or not, pray for them. Do good to those who despitefully, they do it because they like it. And they use you. Wow. Notice the other verse. It really kind of expands and calls at least me to a higher degree of accountability because it's so packed. Notice that verse. It says that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. 
Do you know why you ought to love your enemies? Because God does. How do you know that God loves his enemies? (laughs) Because he loved you. And if you don't remember, it was the love of God demonstrated when you were in open rebellion, you were his enemy against him, that he came in the person of Christ and died for you. And if God, for Christ's sake, has so loved you, you ought what? Also to love one another. You give up your enemies by loving them. So here we have this text, and you say, well, how in the world, Pastor, am I going to do that? Well, the first thing I think you need to do is you need to know your enemies. In fact, for most of us, it's good just to go back to Webster or Marion or one of those people, uh, Wikipedia, I don't, whichever one you want to go to, you can tell I've been on my phone. It doesn't matter. I mean, be sure it's a credible source. But go and look up the definition. And the definition, if you look it up, of an enemy is a person who is actively opposed to someone or something. That's what an enemy is. So if someone is actively opposed or something is actively opposed against you or against someone you love, you probably see them with a bit of sense that they're an enemy. And so understand what an enemy is and then... In James 4, 4, he tells us real clearly about enemies. I want you to turn there and we read that verse together. It says, you adulterous people, it means you're polluted in your thinking and the way that you live. You've let things come into God's good ideal and you have polluted it. That's what adulterous means. Anytime we have adultery, it doesn't matter if it's in a relationship or if it's in some spiritual area of our life, we have polluted God's ideal. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God or against God? The minute you and I begin to act like the world around us, choose like the world around us, even if we belong to Him, we become an enemy of God. That's why that song was so important. His love never fails, it never runs out, it never gives up on me. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad in that song about great is thy faithfulness? One of my favorite verses is though I become faithless, he what? Remains faithful. And guess what? The God who is holy, the God who is faithful calls you to be both holy and faithful. And I'm telling you right now, it may not make sense and you may not want to do it, but if you will trust God and do it, it can do amazing things. We're going to see that at the end of the story today. But let me just encourage you that, one, an enemy is a person who is in opposition. They're in opposition against you, your very self. God, if you belong to him, the world is going to come against you. And then it says the Savior. They come against Christ. He said, just remember that if they hated you, they hate you, they hated me first. And so an enemy is one who's outside of the will of God. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's other folks like us, and sometimes they're against us, but they're always against the things of God because God wants everything the way he designed it so we can have abundant, overflowing living. And he's against anything that prevents that for you and me. And we ought to be as well. Now, how is this knowing characterized, characterization of this knowing about enemies? Well, one of the ways is you sense threat. That's how you can tell what your enemy is. You sense threat. If someone comes against you, you sense threat. I try to explain this. I always, in fact, I I got to where I really enjoy it. I I do premarital counseling, and I always, when I have the couples come in the first time, and the guy, and he's always sitting over there by himself, and and I I have me a a pretty good-sized book, and I make sure I have one on my desk. And... uh, and I get to this point where I talk about this in the premier, and I take that book and I just pitch it at the guy. He doesn't know it's coming. It has nothing to do as far as he can understand that's related to anything we're doing. And I just love to watch how they respond. You know, some of them will reach out and grab it. And some of them will just let it hit them in the chest, fall in their lap and look at me like, are you an idiot? Now, I love that. 
Because it's a great teaching thing. You see, how you respond is where the accountability is. But if an object is coming at you, God put a God-placed response mechanism there. So when something comes against you, it comes against someone or something that you prize or care about, some ideal that you have. Folks, the church ought to get upset. We ought to get angry about the things that go on in our world that are against what's best for our world. And you ought to go to the polls and do what you can to vote. And you ought to stand up in your community. And I'm going to tell you what. This is where it's hard. You need to stand up to your neighbors. I can love the homosexual couple that lives across the street from my house. But I can tell you what. They know I don't accept that lifestyle. And sometimes it's easier just to walk away than to stand up. But we need to stand up. We need to stand up when it comes to the sacredness of life. We need to stand up when it comes to the sanctity of marriage. We need to stand up when it comes to teaching our children not to be promiscuous. Listen, there's not anything that God asks us to do that when we do it doesn't benefit us. And if we don't get that, we'll never be willing to stand up. But when things come against you, one thing you need to know, it's going to be threatened. And you're going to be energized. In fact, uh, your physiological system has in it uh, a chemical that jumps into place. And when the adrenaline hits, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to become aggressive or you're going to retreat. Now, the bad mistake is when you become aggressive when you should have retreated. (laughs) Usually most of us don't have to get whipped but one or two times to determine where that line is, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it is a mechanism. And anger and fear are not good and they are not bad. But how you act upon them makes them good or bad. And so God has made us to understand when something is an enemy to us, that's threatening to us. And so the, the thing when you characterize an enemy, they're always going to be that which threatens, and there's always going to be a sense of striving. As long as you live in a sinful world, there will be a sense of striving against enemies. You know, Jesus said very clearly in John 16 and 33, as long as you live in this world, you're going to have what? Trouble. Trouble is a type of enemy. And not only are you going to have trouble from the world in which you live, but you're going to have trouble from a world that you can't even see. Now, turn over to Philippians uh, real quick there. I mean, Ephesians 6, 12. And in Ephesians 6, 12, we find the words of the Apostle Paul giving us some clear directives about some things we can't see. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now, granted, that doesn't mean that in the flesh and blood arena you don't have struggles, right? You have people who are adversaries. And how many of you have some sinful appetites? Desire. Things that just, you battle. I certainly do. You don't just struggle with that which is flesh and blood, but you struggle against rulers, against authorities, against powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You can go and read in Genesis 1.31 or Isaiah 14.12 or Luke 10. 18 or Revelation 9, 1 or 12, 3 through 9 or Hebrews 12, 22, a third of the heavenly host under the direction of the person who turned against God in the first place fell and folks, they're trapped. Now, get ready to laugh. Do this for me. Okay? Yeah, well, wait till I tell the joke, Dick. You know, Jerry Clower, who was from Yazoo, Mississippi, 
told one of my favorite stories about a fella that liked to hunt raccoons. He went coon hunting. That's what we call it. And I don't like the kind of coon hunting he did, but he did this kind of coon hunting where the dog chased the coon and run the coon up a tree. They're just not smart in Mississippi. They climb up the tree to shake the coon out. Who would go up a tree to shake an animal that will bite you and claw you? I mean, you're already not on stable ground, and you climb up in I mean, think about this. But then there's always that unexpected, right? The dogs have run the coon, and they have treed the coon, but that's all what? Assumption, right? Because you didn't see the coon. You assume that's what those dogs do because they're coon dogs. But you know what else they'll run? That, no, not up a tree. But that would be bad. <laughs> Brenda, that'd be bad. The, 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 but that's not my story. I'll have to figure out one on this one. It's not Jerry's story anyway, okay? Uh, what, what ha- she said a skunk, <laughs> for those of you who didn't hear. Now, what, what happened is uh, he didn't know that he got in the tree that what they had treed was not a coon, but a cat, a wild cat. Well, you know, shaking a coon out of a tree is one thing. Shaking a bobcat out of a tree is quite another. And, of course, says only Jerry can in his colorful language. They're up there, and he says there's fur and, fur and skin flying. And finally, the fellow who went up the tree hollers down to the people on the ground, shoot up here amongst us. One of us needs some relief. <laughs> Have you ever been trapped? Well, you know, you can laugh about it. We can laugh a little. But I want to tell you what Paul is saying here. Folks, we're trapped with what used to be a heavenly host that is now a fallen demonic host, and it is orchestrated against us and against the things of God. And so not only do we have the opposition and the difficulty with the things that are in this world... We have the opposition and difficulty with things that are otherworldly. Literally, what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to get back to where they came from, but they're already judged, they're waiting for the end of time, and they're trapped here with us. Have you ever been trapped with an angry person? Have you as a spouse ever said to your spouse, you know, the best thing for you to do is just leave me alone. Listen, guys, when they get the book, they go to the bedroom and shut the door. Leave them alone. (laughs) Leave them alone. You know? When he goes out to the building and he shuts and locks the door in the middle of the summer, leave him alone. Well, I don't know what he's doing in there. You don't want to know what he's doing in there. The best thing for you is stay out of there. (laughs) You know? Well, we're trapped. And so... He says to characterize the enemy, there's always a sense of threat that comes to us because of their behavior. There's always a striving going on, both in the world and in the other world. And because of this, we have what we know as an enemy. Know your enemy. Keep your friends close. Ah, so y'all are with me in this text. And that's easy to get to, but then when he says, love your enemies, you said, you've got to be kidding me. What are you talking about? And then you say, Pastor, well, the way that you give your enemies up is to accept them? Well, how do you accept them? Let's go to that second passage uh, for today, found in Luke's gospel. Realize that Jesus has entered the city. He has heard the cry. Hosanna, God, save us now. And they believed that when Jesus came in riding on the back of the coat of a donkey as the Prince of Peace, that he was coming to set up Jerusalem as the nationalistic headquarters of all world power. Now, in that week that would follow, that week we call the week of passion, Jesus knew that the folks who were crying, Hosanna, would soon be crying, crucify. 
And so when he gets and he looks, because he's insightful, he's prophetic, he looks at the city of Jerusalem, verse 41 said, he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city. And, and it doesn't mean he just looked out there and saw it. He saw the city for what it was. He knew in their nationalistic thinking it was only a matter of time to they were going to cross Rome. And when they crossed Rome, Rome would soundly crush them. And in 70 AD, they did. They came, besieged the city. And when they defeated it, they didn't leave one stone standing on another. Fulfillment of this text happened. But when Jesus seeing the city, what did he do? He wept. He knew that God had sent them the Prince of Peace. He knew that they didn't understand what the only peace for their life was. And because of that, he wept. And friend, I want you to know today, for your enemy and mine, if they don't get the truth of Christ, they are never going to have peace. And we ought to weep for them. We ought to weep for them. Now, acceptance means to embrace the person. Now, to embrace them... Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16 gives us some good clues of how to do this. Be wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. What he's saying is you need to practice discretion. You don't just walk out and say, oh, everybody's okay. I'm okay, you're okay. Listen, there aren't any of us that are okay. And if you think that you're okay or somebody else is okay, you're not okay. You're just off track. So when we accept them, we need to be very intentional. We need to understand how people are. Jesus knew what was in man. And when Christ lives in you and he lives in me, we need to know what's in man. And so we need to approach them with sensibility and we need to know that when we choose to embrace a person who is an enemy, there is a price to be paid. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't do unto others as they've done unto you. America would have never done in its warfare what it's done to rebuild and to reclaim countries it's defeated if it followed that. They got in on this, loving your enemies. And I want you to know, it isn't the same for us as it is for them. You know why? Because Jesus has loved us, and he's commanded us to love our enemies. We who once were his enemies, now because we belong to him, have our enemies and we're to love them. But love them with wisdom, have shrewdness, but have compassion. Okay? Have the knowledge when you walk in the door, it's going to cost you something to do this. Then reject their practice. He never meant for us to love the sin of the sinner. In fact, I grew up, and some of the best words I ever got is, Love the sinner and what? Hate the sin. He didn't ever say that we ought to say that what they're doing that is terrible behavior is all right. He never said we ought to allow it to continue to go on in the name of loving our enemies. No, the best thing we can do is to stop what they're doing in order that we might teach them what is right to do. But, you have to reject their practices. Some of their practices are clear and overt. If you want to know what's ungodly, just go read in the book of Galatians 19 through 21. It'll give you a list of the sins of the flesh. But the second thing that you need to do is you need to love them because of their practices that are covert. Now, uh, when we talk about, and most of us hear this, this is a covert operation. That's usually about something that's we don't know all about it. We, we got a bunch of folks in here that work out on this base and, and they have a lot of covert things going on. And, and, and it's kind of interesting if you ask, what do you do? And what do they say to you? If I tell you, I'd have to kill you. That's covert! <laughs> okay? 
You have overt behavior, but you have covert behavior. Now, we have to be real careful both with others and with ourselves in this arena. In fact, Jesus has gone through this whole thing and given us some examples in Matthew's gospel. Go back there to that text. And let's look quickly at some of that covert operation in the world of spiritual dynamics. And I listed those verses for you, so in verse 22, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister has done what? Committed murder in his heart. Hmm. Do you have some covertness in you? Do you see that subversive subtlety that can move not only in you but in your enemy? And they may be smiling and patting you on the back and the whole time... Friend, they're just waiting for the opportunity to slide the blade as Brutus did into Caesar right between your shoulder blades. You know, you need to be wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove, but one of those behaviors is covert. Notice the second one, verse 28. It says, but I tell you that anyone who looks upon a person... Now I want you to know, I know it says woman... But we live in a world where that is no longer woman. It is any person. Because women are as guilty of lustful looking as men are. Now I think men do it more often than on a more regular basis because of the different ways that we're made up. But hey, listen, when, when I grew up, it was just totally inappropriate for a girl to ever call a guy. Ever. And then one generation later, my children are being raised. How many, how many of these girls have called you tonight and asked you out for a date? And one night, four different girls had called my child on the same night to ask him out. I mean, that's just craziness. No, it's human sinfulness that we have this attitude. I'm not saying that if you've called a guy and asked him out or you've called a girl, that you're bad. That, don't, don't overread what I said. But what I'm saying is that the human heart is twisted. And it's not just don't do the bad deed. Catch it when the attitude is there before the deed occurs. You see how that covertness, it's the heart that's the problem. It's not what goes in the man, it's what comes out of him. It's what's in our heart. That's what Jesus is after here. And then in verse 34, he does the same thing again. He says, I tell you, but uh, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other. Just let them beat the living daylights out of you. Well, I'm glad to tell you today, I did go to seminary or cemetery or whatever it was called, and I studied that text. I never liked that text because I'm telling you, if somebody slapped me, uh, you know, once, shame on me. Say, I mean, once, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. And if you actually go back into the Jewish understanding of this, this is a slap of insult which turns your cheek. They can't slap you again if you turn your cheek back unless they hit you open-handed, and that means you force them to face you as an equal. Hold them accountable. Take the sacrificial first step, but don't go any further than that. In fact, if you let somebody beat the daylights out of you, you probably need it. You just haven't got good sense. It doesn't mean that we all let folks that are doing these horrible things we're seeing on TV do it. It doesn't mean that we ought to let a person who's stronger beat on a person who's weaker. It doesn't mean that we ought to allow abusiveness and language and things of that in our home. But it does mean we need to love them. We don't need to love what they do, but we need to love them. And loving them means sometimes preventing them from doing what they got no business doing. And so, it says, reject their practices, both those that are overt and those that are covert. Now, the the problem that I, I wanted to point out about the covert is when that comes to you and me. Because we have a tendency to think that some things are worse than others. Well, it was just a little white... Oh, there we go. It was just a little white lie. Deception is deception. A lie is a lie. Yes, sometimes the ones we tell have greater consequences than others, but they're all wrong. 
God wants the truth at all times from all of us. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. You know, let folks know they can count on what you say and what you do. Let your word be your bond. When you shake hands on something, follow through, even if it costs you. Well, y'all are fanning, and I'm sweating, and we got one point, so let's get through. John 13, 34. Once you have identified and characterized and you know who your enemy is, you know them. And once you have accepted them by embracing them as a person, understanding who and what they are, rejecting the practices that ought not be done, but embracing loving the person who's doing bad practices for their highest good, then finally you have to love them. Love one another as God, for Christ's sake, has loved you. By this, all men, don't don't think that it's just the church. By this, all men will know that you are learners of me. You're my disciples if you what? Have love one for another. And if you love your fellow man, not just the saved ones, the lost ones, not just the ones that you like, but the ones that you know by all these reasons don't like you. You're to love them. Choose their best. That's what love is. It's the highest good. Hold them accountable. Oh, folks, listen. Don't just let sin pass. When a person's out of line, tell them so. Speak it in love. Seeking their highest good. But, you know, if somebody's using that F word or that GD word in your prayer, tell them you don't like it. Tell them it's offensive to you. You may not can stop them from saying it, but you can sure know, let them know that you don't appreciate it. Oh, man, I, the language in our culture is just awful. And, it, and what comes out of the mouth is an indication of what's in the, in the heart. And so, hold them accountable. But then this last one, leave the door open. In Proverbs... 22 and 6, we have that verse, raise up a child in the way she should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. I wish I could tell you that that's a promise, but that's a probability. It's a proverb, and it says in most cases, if you do what's right with the raising of your children, most probably they're going to, in the end, choose the right way. But you've got to hold them accountable. My oldest son was 19. He was not living the way we raised him to live. He was old enough to be on his own and the difficulty between what his behavior was and what we expected was causing huge chaos in our home and we sat him down and we put a piece of paper in front of him with all the rules and regulations that we expected ourselves and our children to follow. There were no double standards. And we said, now son, you got to make a choice. You want house, roof over your head, clothes on your back, food on the table? Then you got to go by the rules. It's your choice. You don't want to go by these rules. You're a man. There's the door. But I want your word. That with God's help, you'll do exactly what's on this sheet of paper. He got up from the table and walked out and didn't sign anything. Ooh, the world is a difficult place to learn truth, isn't it? You know, after he had slept at this house and that house and that house, and, you know, people will be nice to you for a little while, but then all of a sudden they, they let you know, hey, hey, don't come back here. You've been here two weeks. And he, and he burned all those bridges, and he found out he had to find somewhere to live. He had to pay for that. If he was going to put gas in the car, he had to work. If he was going to eat, he had to have some money to buy food. And, you know, life began to be his teacher. He was kind of like the guy in the far country, the prodigal. You know, he finally came to what? His senses. And he looked up and he said, you know, those rules mom and dad gave me are starting to look pretty good. <laughs> starting to look pretty good. Uh, but by this time, he got him another place to live. He joined the military. And guess what they had the first day he stepped on the field. 
Man, they had a list of rules this long. <laughs> and they had some definite punishments if he didn't follow them. But he came back to me years later and he said, Dad, that's the best thing you ever did to me. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know what was going on. You can ask my wife. I wept in my bed at night in fear and concern for my child. But love holds people accountable. Amen. Hold them accountable. That's what love does. But love keeps the door open. If I will love them, then I always have hope. They'll come back to the truth. And praise God, he did. And this morning, he's serving in his church. He's teaching a Sunday school class. And he takes the spiritual leadership in his home to say, get up, it's Sunday morning, we're going to church. It is an optional. Blesses my heart. Now if the other three could just get it. I'm, it's no guarantee. And man, sometimes some folks need more teaching out there than others. But you got to love them. But then there's this thing I've got in pardonable sin. I missed that one on the first one. It's in Matthew 12. And it says that uh, if you commit the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. There is no forgiveness. Now, does that mean that all we sang this morning is not so? Does it mean that God is not faithful? No, it means that God loves you enough that when He's done everything He can do for you, if you totally reject that, His love will punish you. And it will ultimately punish you eternally. But the sin of blasphemy is to hear the convicting work of the Spirit in your heart and in your life and say, that is not of God, or know that it's of God and say, I'm not going to do that. How long? You got till you draw your last breath. Now, I can't tell you when that's going to come. Had a young boy sitting right here. Y'all know Grayson that plays pen? His middle brother tried take down his throat passageway a piece of watermelon that was about four or five times bigger than he should have had in his mouth. He didn't crush it up and get the juice out of it like he should, so when he swallowed, it got stuck right here. And boy, did they have a time getting it loose. And that little old petite mother of his, if y'all ever seen her, she yanked that boy up and shook him till his eyeballs almost fell out. And finally, <laughs> came a big old piece of watermelon. But I tell you what, it put the fear of God in that boy. You should have been out there in the hallway when he came out of the first worship service. You don't ever know when your last breath's going to be. That's why Jesus said, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Why? Because God, God prepared hell for the devil and his angels, not for you. He spent his blood so that you don't have to go there. He came and died so that you can have life overflowing. But he does expect us to teach folks everything that he has commanded us. And one of the things he commanded us was to love our enemies. World War II was over and the horrors of that war in concentration camps and the extermination chambers. And Corey Tim Boone speaks of how she was out in Munich, Germany. Munich, Germany, preaching about God's forgiveness. She came out of the meeting that night, and there standing at the door, she recognized him immediately, was the first SS officer that she faced on her way into the camp. The one who took all, I mean all of her clothes and her sister's clothes along with all those other Jewish women, and piled them in the floor. And who knows what else they did and said. And as she came out the door, he had a glow on his face. And he says, I'm so glad that the blood of Jesus washed my sins away. And he stuck his hand out. She said, and when he did, everything that went on came back. She said, I couldn't lift my hand. He said, Lord, I've been preaching this all over Germany and I can't lift my hand. 
I can't lift my hand. Jesus, if I'm going to forgive this man, you're going to have to help me lift my hand. And she still couldn't lift her hand. And she finally said, Jesus, if you don't do it, I can't. And she felt her hand going out from the side of her body. And when her hand came out and his hand touched her hand, she said electricity went from the joint of her shoulder arm in through her hand and into that man. And she felt a freedom of peace like she had never known. And she loved that man. And he loved the forgiveness of Christ that she extended. You got to give up your enemies. And to this she said, it's not your goodness. It's not your forgiveness. It's being willing to be faithful to the word of God. Do what he says. And the miraculous thing that happens is when you extend his forgiveness and his love, it changes both of you. This morning, folks, give up your enemies. It's God's Word, and He is faithful. He'll give you what you need to do it if you'll just trust Him. If you don't believe me, just ask Corey Timber. Pray with me. Father, thank you.